So good evening. Welcome to our virtual Whalen Library event. We're excited to have Professor Allison Lang here tonight to talk about her new book, Picturing Political Power, Images in the Women's Suffrage Movement. Dr. Lang is an assistant professor of history at the Wentworth Institute of Technology and received her PhD at Brandeis. In addition to her new book, which is published by the University of Chicago, her writing has appeared in Imprint, The Atlantic, and The Washington Post. Dr. Lang also engages in public history and has worked with the National Women's History Museum uh, and curated exhibits for the BPL's Leventhal Map Center uh, for the 2020 centennial of the 19th Amendment, which we are celebrating with this event. She's curate, she is curating exhibits at the Mass Historical Society and Harvard Schlesinger Library. I hope you're still doing that. It so, will open someday. Okay, someday we will see them. Um, thank you so much to Dr. Lang for being here tonight. And I have a couple of Zoom housekeeping notes. So first, we're recording this session um, for broadcast on Wacam, our cable access station. Um, they'll also put it on YouTube so we can send it to our friends. Um, but you may see your tiny video picture on TV briefly unless you turn off your video sharing. Um, during the slide portion of the program, I recommend you switch your view to speaker view, and I will put this information in the chat if you need it again. That way you'll see Dr. Lang's face and her slides instead of everybody else. Um, and finally, feel free to add any questions to the Zoom chat at any time they occur to you. Um, and I will I'll be sure to bring them up at some point, or feel free to message me if you're having any technical trouble. So with that, I think we're ready to get started and I'll hand it over to Dr. Lang. Thank you. Thank you for organizing this and thank you all for joining me this evening. I'm very excited to talk to you about women's history, the history of women's voting rights during this 2020 centennial year and the ways that women have you know, fought for equality in the past, particularly through the use of images, which we'll be looking at a lot of today. And so one of the things that is really nice with like a smaller intimate group like this is that um, I can, I think we can do it a little bit less formally. And um, if you have a question about a picture that I'm putting on the screen, feel free to just put that question in the chat and we can talk about it before I move on. We don't have to kind of save all the questions for the end, though you're also welcome to save questions for the end. So feel free to kind of ask a question as we go and we can we can talk about it. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and start. And um, this is the, the title of my book, um, Picturing Political Power, Images in the Women's Suffrage Movement. And I think one of the things I like to address first is what suffrage means. And even though it's you know um, not a very common term today, it was a very popular term in the 19th century. And it only means the right to vote. And people talked about male suffrage, people talked about black male suffrage, people talked about women's suffrage. But for some reason in the 21st century, it's usually just a term associated with women's voting rights. And it's often, you know, when I talk to my students about it, you know, they think it has something to do with like suffering or something <laughs> like that, but it, it's just about women's voting rights. And so that's specifically what we're thinking about today. And I also, so the kind of general premise of my research and my book is about the ways that images really influence the ways we think about gender and influence the ways we think about kind of like what, um, what manliness is, what masculinity is, um, what leadership is. You know, when you think of the, just like the term president, you probably just immediately think of a man right? We haven't yet had a, a woman. So we often think of men in these positions of power and we have a lot of historical images to, that kind of just reinforce that image for us. Um, and so when we're thinking about this, um, these these women's rights activists were trying to kind of change that in many ways and engage in those kind of visual debates um, throughout the 19th century and into the 20th. And I'd actually like to start probably a little earlier than you guys might be expecting. 
Um, and that's with the, the 18th century, late 18th century. Um, as you all know, as like local Massachusetts residents probably have gone on the Freedom Trail and learned a lot about the Revolutionary Era. Um, and this is a, a, a cartoon, a print, that was made to make fun of the boycotts that women had um, when they were boycotting tea. So this was actually printed in London, so not by a local Bostonian, um, but it was printed in London probably by an artist who just like read an article about this in the local newspaper and decided to kind of imagine what it would look like if women were boycotting tea, if women were participating in politics. And when you look at this scene, this is not a flattering scene of women joining the revolutionary protest. You see a woman with a gavel who has like a very large hook nose, who's not very attractive, definitely not the kind of idealized image of women that you kind of expect from this period. You see a woman in the back, she has like a big bowl in her hand. And for anyone who's been to the MFA, especially since the reopening of the American wing in the past several years, you've seen the, the Sons of Liberty bowl that Paul Revere made. There's a big silver bowl when you enter. And that was a bowl for alcohol. It was a bowl for punch, right? So you have these women gathered, they're drinking. Um, and underneath the table, you see a child that they're not paying any attention to, right? So they're participating in politics, they're neglecting their duties, this child is not being cared for, there's a dog is the only thing paying attention to the child, and the dog is urinating on a tea canister, which is a surprisingly popular theme in these cartoons. So this is something that, you know, is really common. The other detail that I really want to make sure that we notice is there's a black woman in the background, right next to the woman who is drinking the punch bowl. And just to remind you, this is Edenton in North Carolina, so she's probably supposed to be an enslaved woman. And she looks like she too is interested in signing this boycott. And the reason why I want to kind of point her out too is that the cartoonist is not only suggesting that if women participate in politics, this gender, gender roles will shift, right? They'll abandon their children, they'll become drinkers, they'll, they'll, they won't be these kind of moral um, uh, symbols of virtue. So gender roles will shift, but also racial hierarchy will shift too, right? And not only racial hierarchy, um, but the economy that's based on slavery. So there, it's kind of this argument of like, you don't want women to do this. You don't want the revolution to happen because it'll be this slippery slope and you'll eventually get women in power and you might eventually get enslaved people participating in politics too. And so this is kind of, this picture is intended to kind of make people laugh because of the absurdity of this scene to people in the 18th century. I mean, also make people a little bit afraid of like what might happen if these things come to pass. So this is one that's, you know, about 75 years later, and it's not that different. But of course, in the past, in the 75 years, this is from 1851, there were a lot of dramatic shifts in the women's rights movement, right? So 1851, that's three years after Seneca Falls, and the Declaration of Sentiments written by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, it's one year after the very first National Women's Rights Convention, which actually occurred in Worcester, Massachusetts, so not that far from us. We have like a claim to fame in Massachusetts. And this was published um, in New York, and this was um, um, an, a lithograph. So it was a really cheaply produced, fairly accessible print by the 1850s, whereas the one I showed you earlier was very expensive, um, a, a very fine print, much more elite um, people would have been able to purchase that one in comparison to this one. And so we see in the center here, we have, this is uh, Mrs. Turkey in the center, she's uh, smoking. And on the wall behind her, if you're not sure what her kind of position is, you see the Women's Rights Convention uh, like framed on the wall behind her. 
and she has her hand kind of patronizingly placed on a, a man's head who's like covered hunched over in like a turban and he's like mending clothes so a very menial domestic task and again she's abandoned her children right like this child is in the front he's wearing a, has a banner in hand that says no more papa and mama you know there she's not paying attention to him um, and in the background, we have two women who are, are, are you know, one woman who's clearly intended to be a uh, kind of domestic servant, no more basement and kitchen. And they're both wearing bloomers, by the way. So you can see their skirts are a little bit short and they've got these bloomers and those are pretty controversial in the 1850s. They were intended to kind of be more freeing, more practical attire. Um, and so this was associated with women's rights activists. And even though today it might look very, um, very perfectly conservative attire, um, in the 1850s, that was a quite short skirt, <laughs> a pretty scandalous skirt to be able to even like see the form of the leg. And on the ne right next to her, we have a black woman smoking a pipe. You often see these women's rights activists smoking in these pictures. And it says, no more massa and misses, right? So this idea that there should be no more slavery too. So this is linking again, women's rights and the rise of women's rights with the abandonment of their families, the feminization of men who are now having to do these menial tasks, the, the downfall of slavery, the rise of black people as uh, political participants, leaders um, and even this shift in kind of like class roles right as domestic servants so we see this all being linked together this is very similar to that 1775 print and i'm just going to show you a few more examples because what i'd like to get across is that these are just a few examples of what are thousands of images that people are encountering right so I can't imagine, you know, a century from now with all of our social media images, like some people like kind of like picking one image and saying, this is what people were looking at, but this is what I'm doing to you, right? This is, these are some of the just examples of just a few, but are very representative of popular pictures. So people had stereotypes of women's rights activists. You know, when people went to a, a talk by Lucy Stone, a local Massachusetts leading suffragist, people expected her to look masculine. And you have, you can find in the archives some comments like, I expected her to look really manly, but actually she didn't look that way. Um, people are actually surprised by this. And so this is another cartoon from Harper's New Monthly Magazine, which eventually became Harper's Monthly Magazine and Harper's Weekly, which is, you know, one of the most popular, widely circulated magazines of the 19th century. Um, and we see these women smoking again. Uh, their, their bloomers are far too short, even shorter than the last one. You see one woman actually pulling up her pant leg to, to you can actually see her ankle. Um, and these women are even wearing more masculine kind of top hats and things with the I love the addition of the bulldog at the bottom too just in case you weren't sure like that they're supposed to be kind of aggressive and you know masculine um, and so we also even have a suggestion that we have two women in the scene kind of linking arms even the suggestion that men are not needed here you see the back of a man on a cart um, and he's kind of fleeing the scene of these of these women that have, have taken over this this space. So um, th this is a really popular type of image. And I want to give you another sense of these pictures. This is 1869. So we are now at almost a century out of that first image I showed you. And this is by Courier and Ives. I don't know if you guys have ever heard the, the holiday song uh, Sleigh Ride, but the Courier and Ives is like a, a company named in that song. So it was a really popular print company in the 19th century. Um, they made these really widely accessible to Americans, you know, and there are decorative things. You put them in your home, your office. Um, people would just encounter these a lot. They're pretty cheap. Um, and these are, this is the Age of Brass or the Triumphs of Women's Rights, 1869. Some of you might know is the year that women were allowed to vote in the territory of Wyoming for the first time. 
So this is the 151st year of women voting in Wyoming, actually, which is pretty amazing. And so this is also the moment when, after the Civil War, Americans are debating whether newly freed peoples should vote too. So this is that moment of reconstruction where there's some possibility that women will gain the right to vote. Um, but by 1869, people are pretty confident that the 15th Amendment, which prohibits voting discrimination based on race, will pass. So that's, so there's a lot of question about, you know, who should vote in the United States. Um, and we see that kind of anxiety here, right? We have vote for the celebrated man tamer. You know, these women are going to, to tame the men. Um, her name is Susan Sharptongue. Um, and one of the interesting things that I find about this picture is that we have a woman in the front wearing bloomers, which I should note, women, women's rights activists had abandoned the bloomer costume of 1851. So, several decades earlier, um, but there are also women wearing more traditional clothing here, uh, more traditional fashions, but these are like outlandish versions of traditional fashions, right? Like in the woman in the center, the bow is as large as her head. <laughs> so these women can't win, whether you're wearing these more masculine, practical, clothes like bloomers or you're wearing more traditional fashionable feminine clothes they're still going to make fun of you and a lot of the popular cartoons of the day really reflect that there's a ton making fun of women in crinolines which are very funny you know of women like floating away into the air like a hot air balloon there's there's a lot <laughs> and so once you know you see these images, you know, just making fun of women constantly, suffragists are interested in changing the narrative, right? So this is a mo so we were looking at a lot of engravings, a lot of engraved illustrations. And um, it's one of the things that happens in 18, the late 1830s is there's the development of the photograph for the first time. Um, but at first, it's a daguerreotype. And a daguerreotype, I don't know if any of you guys have seen one before, but they're made on metal plates and you can't reproduce them. So you can't really, you know, circulate a bunch of images of Sojourn or Truth on a daguerreotype, it's impossible. But in the 1850s, late 18, it's 1855 and on, you have people printing photographs on paper. So these are carte de visite. And even though they're really big on the screen, they are tiny in person. They are like baseball card size. I always tell my students, like these were like really cheap, you wanted like your favorite actors and your favorite political leaders and your favorite, you know, artists, Act, you know, anyone who you were interested in kind of, you wanted to collect them all, trade them with your friends, you'd have your picture taken, you'd get a picture of your friend and you'd exchange them, et cetera. And, you know, you'd put them all in an album that you have in your parlor and show all your friends, you know, which, which collect, what your collection looked like. You know, this is a period where you can't just like Google search, you know, what some world leader looks like. You know, this is a world where people are not only purchasing a photograph of Abraham Lincoln, but also Jefferson Davis, because they simply have no idea. Otherwise, they won't know what these, these political leaders look like. So Sojourner Truth um, is, uh, was, a, was born in New York State. Um, and she was born an enslaved woman, and she escaped slavery in her 30s and moved to Massachusetts. This is all coming back to Massachusetts again. Um, and she became a really powerful leader in the anti-slavery and women's rights movements. And Frederick Douglass is kind of one of the people who was also um, a, a, a person who escaped slavery and became another um, anti-slavery civil rights leader. Um, they both really believed in the power of photographs to be, um, to counter racist stereotypes. And so what we see in this picture is truth kind of in this very parlor-like domestic setting, um, showing you that she is knitting, she has these flowers on the table, she's very simple for 19th century clothes, these are very simple, <laughs> like plain clothes. Um, she looks very dignified, very respectable. Um, and this is in stark contrast to what most of 19th century Americans would have expected a black woman to be. 
especially a woman in general who traveled the country giving lectures to the public. That was not at all common or expected or even approved of of women in the 19th century. And so one of the things we have happening very soon after that, this is a portrait taken of Stan and Anthony in 1870 in New York City. They're very much looking at people like Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Uh, and Sojourner Truth, and they're saying those photographs are really powerful. What can we do to counter stereotypes that we're seeing too? And so Stan and Anthony take this photograph, very different type of photograph, right? They have a very different look on their face. They are far more aggressive, far more defiant. It was not really common for women who are not related to take photographs together. They really embody the movement here. And so they, they, as white women, they're not kind of countering the same stereotypes that Sojourner Truth was. But they're still, you know, as these women make themselves more visible to the public, you know, as, as the Americans start to know, like, what does Susan B. Anthony look like with these photographs? The cartoonists start depicting particular suffrage leaders, right? So you see this, this illustration from 1873, Susan Anthony with her hand on her hip, a very short skirt again. She even has spurs on her boots, by the way. Um, and there's a police woman on the side. There's a political rally of women in the background, which there were no, none of these public protests of women in 1873, that was not happening. Um, and on the side, we have actually one of my favorite things, which is like, as, as you saw in an earlier piece, the, a man carrying a baby is kind of like the end of the world and another man carrying groceries, right? This is what was gonna happen if women were gaining political power here. And the artist really, you know, you can see copied the, the photograph directly from that, uh, that earlier scene by Sereny. And we, you may not know, but you've probably a lot, seen a lot of portraits of Anthony in profile. And that's because she had an eye issue um, and she didn't like people to see it. But you can see in actually this close-up version that the artist actually replicated that eye issue in this illustration, which is just like an added dig at this, at this woman who, who worked so hard um, to, um, to, to, to lead this movement. You know, she really wanted to look more like these political leaders, right? These respectable, dignified um, politicians, these presidents. This is a, just a, an example of campaign propaganda from 1880. Um, and so they eventually decided to create the history of women's suffrage. And if you're at all interested in this, they're all digitized and available online. Um, but they are six 1,000 page volumes that, <laughs> <laughs> yes, they, this is a quite a significant uh, series. Um, and they include some of the earliest portraits that really create kind of the, the names that we remember today. Most of the suffrage names that you think of now probably were, you know, emphasized in the history of women's suffrage and the portraits that are really easily accessible in museums and libraries and documentaries are often from places like the history of women's suffrage. They really, they really shaped the way that we think about who the important women's voting rights activists were. And that's really important because they decided, Stan and Anthony decided that they were the important ones. <laughs> and even though the Lucy Stone and the Massachusetts American Women's Suffrage Association was far larger and um, had a far more successful periodical, the Women's Journal, theirs only lasted two years, the Women's Journal lasted I think 50, <laughs> so, so this, this is a very different, um, very particular perspective. Lucy Stone received very little attention in the history of women's suffrage. Similarly, they did not feature Sojourner Truth, who they knew well, who worked with them regularly, um, and they did not feature any um, other black women's portraits in the history of women's suffrage either. They really wanted white women to be the face of their movement. The other thing that's interesting is that they didn't include any men. You know, we often think about suffragists as being women, but actually there were a there are many men who were prominent leaders in the suffrage movement. Frederick Douglass, Lucy Stone's husband, Henry Brown Blackwell, um, Parker Pillsbury, all of these men who were very important proponents 
of, um, of women's votes. And so this is something that, you know, different medium, same, same joke, right? These, these new women, 1897, she's going to go ride her bike and leave her husband to do the laundry and care for the children. Things are not changing that much. So interestingly, the anti-suffrage imagery stays the same. The pro-suffrage imagery changes. Um, and by the early 20th century, it's no longer just Anthony trying to coordinate a visual campaign. The National American Women's Suffrage Association actually has a national press committee, local press committees, publicity professionals, their own publishing house. It's like a publicity campaign that we might be more familiar with today. Um, and this is what they're emphasizing too. They're no longer emphasizing that women are going to be great presidents and political leaders. They're emphasizing that women need the vote because they're good mothers, right? So this is by Blanche Ames, who was actually a local Massachusetts um, activist and artist. She's part of this early generation of professional female artists. And it's double the power of the home. Two good votes are better than one. And you can see that she is with her three children, in this kind of idealized home with the tea kettle on the stove steaming away, um, God bless our home sign in the background. And so what the suffragists are saying is this is the kind of voter you want, right? She, you know, she's exactly the kind of person that we need to have more voters of. And here's another great one by Rose O'Neill, who was the designer of the Cupid doll, if you've ever heard of those. Um, give mother, mother the vote, we need it. You can see that these children are kind of marching um, for things like our food, our health, our homes, our schools, et cetera. Why are men only, why are our fathers only taking care of these issues when our mothers are traditionally res responsible for these? And so they're really actually leaning into traditional gender roles, right? So they're arguing against all of those anti-women's rights cartoons over the years that said that women in politics would neglect their families and saying, no, actually women in politics are going to help their families. And so the, the, the image of the suffragists changed over this time. So they're no longer the frumpy, dowdy women. They are the fashionable ladies um, in the 1910s. And you can see this is very much similar to the Gibson girl ideal of that time period. And, you know, one of the women who is a great example of who's being kind of left out by the popular suffrage narrative is Mary Church Terrell. And Terrell was one of the first um, Black women to earn an undergraduate degree in the United States. And she moved to D.C. and she became an activist there, a teacher and then an activist. Um, she ended up being elected the first president of the National Association of Colored Women, which was founded in 1896. And it was made up of women who realized that this mainstream white suffrage movement wasn't really thinking about their concerns, right? So they're not only looking for the vote, they're also thinking about the ways that by the 1890s, Black men are losing the vote, right? You guys are familiar with the literacy tests and poll taxes and things that start getting passed in the 1890s in the South. Um, and so they're thinking about Black men are losing the vote. 1896, that's Plessy versus Ferguson. That's the legalization of segregation. Um, and they're thinking about the violence that they're facing, the fact that their children don't have good schools. And so they're not only thinking about suffrage in the National Association of Colored Women, but they're also thinking about this range of issues that they want to fight for, that these other white women's suffrage organizations just aren't really taking very seriously. And Terrell has her own ideal, right? So she's creating her own idea of what, a, what, what she calls a new Negro woman was to look like, right? A very respectable, very genteel, highly educated woman. Um, and so this is the kind of ideal that she is promoting herself. Um, and she's one of the people who actually marched in the 1913 parade in Washington, D.C., which was the first national suffrage parade. And the reason why I want to show you, I want to show you a cartoon about it. Um, she was not, um, it wasn't that everyone was excited about having women of color march in the parade. As you guys might know, Ida B. Wells um, integrated this parade at um, the Howard University sorority. Delta Sigma Theta marched in this parade, um, but people were not always happy about this. And I'm showing this, you know, racist cartoon to give you a sense of the ways that people at the time saw it. This cartoonist is not only critiquing the white women who are appalled to march with these black women, 
it's also critiquing the black women, right? This is a racist stereotype. You can see the exaggerated features, the unflattering imagery. In fact, the woman with the umbrella is kind of like this similar, wearing similar clothes to Susan B. Anthony um, from the 1870s, the illustration we looked at a little bit ago. And so this is a really negative stereotype of not only white suffragists, but also black suffragists. So you can see why Terrell really wanted to fight back against that stereotype when she was cultivating her public image. You know, she really wanted to show that she was a really dignified, respectable, highly educated, refined woman. And I wanted to show you guys this in this image because it is the only image in my like you know, decade of research in archives across the country that really shows um, people advocating for black women's right to vote because they're good mothers. Usually I find portraits of, you know, lots of suffered propaganda emphasizing that white women are good mothers. And this is kind of like the one, you know, all the other images that I'm showing you are like examples of po popular images. And this is kind of one kind of more unique image that I'm showing you. This is from the Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston. And it's a woman who is beating down Jim Crow laws and segregation laws and the grandfather clause with a bat that's labeled federal constitution. And she has children in her skirt and she's doing this to, to protect them. And so it's called the South's Battalion of Death, what votes for women means to the South. And so one reason that suffragists really emphasized that white, they were fighting for the vote for white women, that white women were the leaders of their cause, is that they believed that Southern voters wouldn't support the 19th Amendment or women's voting rights if they were advocating for the vote for women of color. Um, ultimately, this didn't really, wasn't a successful strategy for them. Um, if you've ever seen like a, a map of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, you know that most Southern states didn't ratify it anyway. So it wasn't such a successful strategy in the end. Um, but this was a, a strategy that they were, they were really emphasizing. The, the emphasis on white women's votes was really central to their, um, to their visual campaign. And one thing that kind of is at the end that I think that um, is really maybe even more meaningful in our current health crisis moment is this emphasis in the final years of um, the kind of caregiving role that women gave during World War I, the fact that women were stepping up as nurses um, and um, as uh, kind of supporters in the war effort, whether at, as farmers or nurses. Um, but then also in the, in the months after the end of World War I, when women were stepping up as nurses during the flu pandemic. And so one of the things that happens is that as women are um, deployed overseas, they're then also, as, as soldiers are coming back home, then deployed um, throughout the United States to care for, um, care for Americans. And when we're looking at kind of the, the speeches that politicians gave to support the 19th Amendment, we see a lot of women deserve the right to vote because they have given so much, because they have demonstrated that they're patriotic. Um, moral, helpful citizens, caregivers. And so images like this were extremely popular to give, give that sense, to demonstrate that they were equal citizens. And I want to kind of give you guys a, a postscript. Um, perhaps you guys have seen images or remember images from the 2017 Women's March. You know, we were looking at a lot of very professional, organized images from the suffrage movement in uh, the 1910s, but one of the things that stands out in the 21st century is the preference for kind of individualized imagery, very highly individual quotes and pictures. And these were the actual official images that the Women's March artists put out. Um, they put them online, made them digital, made them freely accessible to download and people could print them out. But these are probably not the ones you remember. <laughs> um, and instead, it's like these, these individual posters. And here's Susan B. Anthony, of course, um, and these individual slogans. You know, people are really kind of putting their own stamp on things in the 21st century in a way that suffragists of the early 19th and of the early 20th century was would not have understood they wanted these highly coordinated professional visual campaigns um, and i also in you know we've seen a lot of women wearing white women in political positions uh wearing white to kind of re recall the suffragists too 
And that's been because, um, as, as you guys know, um, you've seen kind of women parading perhaps before, um, and they are wearing white in historical pictures because that shows up better on a dark background in a black and white newspaper. And so it was really, um, it, it was really about getting a good picture for the press. Um, by wearing white here. And even in these pictures of 21st century politicians, they, and when you see them in a big, you know, the, in the Capitol, for example, you can really pick them out of the room today too. And I wanted to kind of pull in some current imagery, you know, that we're seeing right now um, and connect it to the kind of suffrage activism that we saw a century ago. This is from the 1913 parade, Inez Milholland. She was considered to be the most beautiful suffragist um, and certainly was one of the very most famous suffragists. And I don't think it's coincidence that this photograph of a black woman on a horse has also been really um, popular and kind of um, people have found, felt drawn to it even in the past couple of weeks. There's something about a woman riding on a horse in a protest that, that really draws media attention. And I also think that this kind of imagery is really interesting too. Um, you guys might know that the suffragists were the very first ever organization to pick at the White House. And you know that's probably like a normal thing. If you've ever visited the White House, there's always someone like protesting something. It doesn't you know matter. Um, but you know these are these women standing outside the White House in 1917, saying, "Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty?" And I don't think it's a coincidence that today it's still a real site for political conversation and political protest. And I think that one reason for that is because of the suffragists a century ago. And before I kind of stop my share of my screen, I usually, if I'm like visiting in person, I usually give out these very cute little cards with a discount code. Um, if you're interested in the book and you would like a discount, if you get it through the University of Chicago Press website and use this code UCPNEW, you can get 20% off. And I'm happy to kind of put that in the chat or something if you like to, but I just want to give you guys the opportunity if you're interested in that, in that discount code. I'm very eager to answer your questions um, uh, and as, we, as we chat together here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we didn't get much of a questions in the chat. Um, one person commented on, on the hairdo in one of, the, one of your earlier slides. It was very uh, pronounced. But um, does anyone have any questions right now? I have a few if no one else does. I have some questions. Yay. <laughs> right, let me put this back on, make like easier there. Um, one of them was on the very first picture. If you look off on the middle to the left, what was it? They were pouring tea or they're pouring sugar or what are they doing? Yeah, I'll pull that up for you. They're actually pouring... It's, 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 you're right, they're pouring tea. And so is like, this is the spot here. Yeah, is that they're, supposed to be another man? I couldn't figure out what, what that was. Fair. <laughs> these, these women are intended to look like men, so your confusion is, uh, <laughs> is justified. Um, yeah, so I think that the, the people holding the receptacles are men. Okay. And that these women are pouring these tea canisters or what, you know, in the 18th century, people would have immediately known to be tea canisters um, out. So they're boycotting tea and this is kind of their, their act of patriotism here. Got it. Got it. There's a lot going on in these 18th century cartoons, right? Like I feel like modern cartoons are a lot more streamlined, a lot more simplified, but, but these kinds of cartoons really tell like say a lot there's there's a lot of storytelling happening here but and that was my other question was is the whole thing on the next picture was the the huge elongated hair was that supposed to mock them or not this one the next one the one they're all standing there yeah is that like they're mocking them for like i don't know in one way or another or is that yeah. the hairstyle then <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so, you know, women in the 21st century also wear a lot of hair extensions, at least in Hollywood they do. In the 19th century, you also, if you were fairly well off, had a, a maid to do your hair and had lots of hair extensions. 
but people did not wear hairstyles quite like this. Like this is this, you know, this is this part of the part of the image that's making fun of women who follow fashions, right? It's making fun of women who wear bloomers and these more masculine clothes, but it's also making fun of women who like fashion too much. Other questions? Go ahead, Patricia. No, it's not a question. It's just an observation of um, not realizing how um, racial discrimination was taking place then in a movement. Um, you, you would think a movement such as, as that would create more of a, you know, a less segregated type of situation, but n I never knew that there was that type of discrimination going on at that time for the same movement. And, and it's just an observation that's something I, I did not know, so. I think that's a really good point. And I think part of that is because some of the early suffragists really didn't want us to know that. Like that's not what they wanted us to remember of their movement. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, that's, that seems, you know, that doesn't seem surprising. Um, early on, like in the 1850s, black and white suffragists were working together pretty closely, even through the Civil War, they were working together pretty closely. Um, but it's over the 15th Amendment, which, as I said, um, really prohibits voter discrimination based on race. Yeah. If that's the moment where Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton decide that they're angry that the Republican Party and other reformers are not supporting women's voting rights and are instead um, in, ensuring that newly freed black men can vote. And so that's when they kind okay. of peel off and they um, actually team up with a white supremacist named George Francis Train to fund their new organization. Yeah, this is a, like not the part of uh, history that, <laughs> that, um, that they want us to remember, right. um, to fund their new newspaper, The Revolution. Um, but it's at the same time where the less remembered group, Lucy Stone's American Women Suffrage Association in Boston with Julia Ward Howe um, and many other local women, they support the 15th Amendment and they encourage, they continue to work with people of color like Sojourner Truth. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really Stan and Anthony that really encouraged this early, you know, racism, I think we can say. Yeah, um, and, very, and, very interesting. Yeah, push that, that divide, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. And I think one of the other things that it's important for today is, um, you know, we often think about um, kind of like for, for 21st century conversations about race, you know, why are there these divisions among women's rights activists? And I think it's fair that to, to, to really recognize that these are historical divisions. These are over a century old. There is a reason why some of our institutions are like women's rights institutions are kind of like a legacy of this. And so I think that's really important to remember. I would like to also just make that comment that it had to be a woman to write Black Lives Matter in big yellow letters heading to the White House. <laughs> <laughs> favorite moment all year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right? <laughs> you <Yeah>. miss that. <laughs> That's a really good point, right? This is a, this is a, that was a protest also really encouraged and approved by a female mayor. And that, that's pretty, um, an, another pivotal shift in a type of protest at the White House. It's pretty fascinating to see. Yeah, when you're living in the shadow of the White House, you can still do something, right? Yeah. Right. I have a question about, um, the publications all these images were in and who would have seen them like mm -hmm. was there a lot I mean I don't know if you have numbers but like what percentage of the population would have read these publications yeah so it depends on the precise one we're talking about yeah. but when we're thinking about something like this courier and Ives print this is something um, that would have been pretty accessible to most Americans you know certainly not the poorest Americans, but kind of a, a comfortable, uh, a middle class American, upper class American probably would have purchased several Courier and Ives prints regularly. Um, this would have been very inexpensive. Um, 
This is slightly different. It's an illustrated newspaper, even cheaper, right? So this is something that people, these were disposable. You pick them up and learn about the latest presidential debate or the latest news about the Civil War, very, even, even more inexpensive. And you can see the quality of the illustration is different too, right? This one's a little bit finer, um, more of a work of art. And this one's a little bit more of like telling a story for a joke. Um, and these carte de visite photographs were also extremely cheap. So it cost, um, it was about the price of two illustrated newspaper copies. So like two copies of a newspaper to buy one carte de visite. So also very inexpensive, very accessible. Um, if you were living in a place like Boston, um, you would have gone to a local photography studio um, and you would have looked at their gallery and you would have like bought a few photographs. And when Stanton came to town or Anthony came to town, she would have sat for a photograph and left it there and the photographer would have sold it. Um, if you were um, living further out, you would have gotten a catalog. You could have requested a catalog and just mailed in your money and told them, I want the photograph of, you know, the, the Civil War battlefield at Antietam. That's the one I really want in my collection. And they would have, would have sent it to you there. So um, it depends on the particular piece we're looking at. But the ones that I'm showing you today were very much public pictures. They were very accessible. And that's why I chose them. These are not... Um, kind of the private pictures that someone would have just made for themselves. Um, yeah. I, I really thought it was important to look at public pictures that were widely accessible because they really give us the best sense of the ways that people were thinking about like women in politics and mm. men in politics um, in this time period. So then my next question would be like, could you talk a little bit about how you do your research or do history looking at imagery versus text? Like what different angles can you take if you're examining the visual in turn, instead of text? Yeah, there's so much. I mean, I often look at text and images together, but you know, when I'm teaching, images are such a great entry point for us. Um, you know, text, you know, when you're reading a 19th century American's like diary or, you know, news article, it feels very distant. They use very different words. They're noticing very different things. But for some reason, looking at the pictures they create or just we, we have immediate reactions to them, even if we're not interpreting them correctly. So, for example, when I show this to my students, they'll look at a picture like this and say, oh, well, this is an early feminist image. You know, this is, this is an idea of, you know, celebrating Susan B. Anthony and women in politics. And this is a positive image, but, but as we know, <laughs> um, this was, you know, making fun of her. This was envisioning a scene that 19th century Americans could not have imagined. So I think one of the things that's really important when we're looking at images, but when we're also looking at texts is to like put our 19th century American glasses on and kind of imagine like, you know, look at other things that people are looking at in 1873 and, and see how this compares to that. Um, people, men were not taking care of children in 1873. I mean, I think that <laughs> this is a trope that has died, like the man carrying the baby as the sign of the apocalypse. Like I think <laughs> that that visual theme is no longer true, even though there's still commentary about like men not taking care of all the housework, etc. There's a whole different conversation. But you don't see this kind of cartoonish picture of a man holding a baby anymore. But in the 19th century, we saw two cartoons just now thinking about that, right? Yeah. So I mean, in this one, you even have the woman with her glasses on signaling that she's far too educated for her own good, you know, kind of telling him what to do. So, yeah, it, I think that understanding the visual context, um, just as you do with text, is, is really crucial for analyzing historical pictures. So I have one other question. Do you think that there, the newspapers or whatever the reading material was, was geared as much towards the women or were they, were they getting to read as much or were yeah. they, it was mostly geared toward the men? Americans were really particularly highly literate 
in, in the 19th century. Um, even if women were not being, you know, college educated the way their, their male, you know, counterparts, their brothers or something would have been, they would have been able to read. Um, and I think that your question actually gets to a much bigger point, which is, it's not that all women wanted the right to vote and all men opposed them. It's in fact that most men and women throughout the 19th century opposed the vote. And there's a small vocal group of men and women who wanted it. Um, and that changes um, in the, uh, really around the late 19th century and into the 20th. Um, and as some of you might know, Massachusetts is actually home to the very first national anti-suffrage group or its state anti-suffrage group is started in 1895. Um, it eventually had offices on Boylston Street, you know, right down the street from the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, and so Massachusetts is the heart of anti-suffrage as well as a center for pro-suffrage activism. And anti-suffrage organizing was really led by women. Um, and so it's often led by women who you know, were probably also having dinner with the governor who had kind of elite status and wealth and power that gave them a different kind of power than voting, than political power. Um, and that's kind of what one, one most associates with them. And I always thought Phyllis Schlafly was a little like that, right? She wanted to run for office. They wouldn't let her run for office. So she said, screw you. And she started her own little thing going, so. Yeah, I, I think that she is a perfect example of the kind of descendant of the anti-suffragist, right? In fact, there are examples of anti-suffrage leaders who went on to run for office after women won the right to vote because they realized that they were participating in politics as anti-suffrage activists, um, and they liked that. And so I think that, that's, that, that the connection to Phyllis Schlafly um, makes a lot of sense. There's this wonderful political cartoon that we showed at the Mass Historical Society exhibition last year about um, it's like a suffragist making fun of anti-suffragists about how they like went to go give a lecture about how women should stay at home. And, you know, that's very much the kind of rhetoric we see with, you know, around Phyllis Schlafly in the 1970s and 80s. And I'm sure if any of you guys have seen the new Mrs. America TV show, like that's very much like a tension um, that's highlighted in that show. Any other questions? Um, uh, Dr. Lang and I were talking before we got started. She was telling me about um, teaching at Wentworth, which is 80 something percent male. 83. And not a lot of history majors, I would assume. None. So just wondering if you could chat about that for a little bit. What that, what's that like? Sure. So I've had um, several classrooms that are all, all men, and I've even taught a women's history class to a, a group of all men. And um, it's really interesting. I think that, you know, there's this initial inclination to kind of not be interested in women's history, especially when you're teaching an entire group of men. It's, there's like a group dynamic around it, right? But then I find that, um, once you get them hooked on something and interested in a particular person or like even the fact that anti-suffragists were women, like once you kind of complicate the story, um, you can interest them just like you would in any other topic. Um, if, I don't know if any of you guys have seen Iron Jawed Angels. It's an old HBO show that features Hilary Swank as Alice Paul. And um, it's really like got some fascinating like scenes of the 1913 Washington DC parade and the pickets of the White House and the, the arrests and the, the, the hunger strikes, et cetera. It's really like gripping. It's a good drama. It's not fully factual, but it's a good drama of the suffrage movement. And my students like walk away from that movie thinking, Alice Paul is amazing, right? Like she's a fascinating leader. Why haven't I learned about her before? Um, and so it, it, it's been really great. I think that um, students really like it. I mean, it's not something they usually learn about um, in their high school history classes. Um, the state standards don't really require students to learn much about women's history, even in the 21st century. Um, and if you guys are interested in learning more about the 1910s and the suffrage movement, um, keep your eyes peeled for the new American Experience documentary that's coming out 
in the next month or two. It's called The Vote. And it is all about the suffrage women in the 1910s. And I'm sure it'll be on your local PBS station. I'm sure you can find out what those precise dates will be for you. But um, it's got some great like early video film footage oh, of the cool. picketers that I had never seen before. It's really cool. Cool. That's exciting. Yeah, it is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, if no one else has any questions, anybody? I was just going to ask one other one, which is, yeah. I don't know if you ever saw the movie um, for the Civil War with, uh, is it Louis Day Daniel or whatever his name is? Oh, Daniel Day Lewis, yeah. Daniel Day Lewis. And yeah. they have that scene where, like, and maybe the women will get to vote. And then the whole thing breaks out laughing. I can remember sitting in the theater going, that was just one of those moments where you're like, the image just stuck with you, like, how horrible it is to, like, listen to them just say, and start laughing, you know? So, yeah. And you can, hopefully after seeing these pictures, you can imagine even the, the context of that. Like they would have laughed at women's voting rights regularly when they looked at the, their newspapers. Yeah. I've seen some of the descriptions of what they did to Susan B. <laughs> she had to be one hard ass to keep getting out there and doing that. Yeah. I mean, all of them. Um, the, the threats of violence that they all received, especially women of color when they were out lecturing. Um, and I think that's something, I think you're really important, it's really important that you mention that because that's sort of the thing that we often forget, the fact that they put themselves in danger in these public spaces. Um, because now it just seems like, oh yay, Susan B. Anthony, oh yay, Ida B. Wells. Um, we don't remember like how much people truly opposed them in the 19th century truly thought that they were not leaders that, that should be in museums but like women who should not be speaking in these public spaces yeah. and yeah, also that's a really important point yeah, when you're talking about making fun of their appearance and their clothing and just thinking about hillary in the last election and how yeah, much I mean, has has not changed that's exactly. what my introduction is about <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the celebrated man tamer text just really stands out to me, right? And I think that um, people still apply that kind of very similar language to leading women, you know, in 2020. Um, and, you know, we still are forced to kind of walk a line of being, um, you know, very, very, very feminine attire if you're a public figure or not too feminine attire if you're a public figure. Um, and, and maybe emphasizing your role as a caregiver if you're a politician, kind of emphasizing that you're also having dinner with your kids if you're, you know, also on the campaign trail. We see this in social media all the time. And, and so I think that it's, that you're right to note that these are conversations we still have. What did you say, Carol? I said making cookies. Making cookies. There you go. <laughs> that is precisely it. And um, if I learned anything from doing this research is that, you know, the things that were popular a century ago, we're still negotiating with those exact same ideas today in many ways. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Yes, this was wonderful. Thank you. Yes. If we thank could you all for clap. Coming. <laughs> That's great question. Thank you very much. Um, if you could send me your the the discount code, oh, I can sure, yeah, I can exactly. email it out to everyone yes. who came. Um, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you again. Everybody have a good night and stay safe. Yes. Well. Thank you very much Bye. again for your wonderful questions. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.